Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Movie stars are America's royalty. Elizabeth Taylor was queen, and her long reign has come to an end. As you've likely heard, Elizabeth Taylor died today in a Los Angeles hospital surrounded by her four children. As soon as the news broke, some of her many fans placed flowers on her star along the Hollywood Walk of Fame, honoring a woman whose work and life were part of our culture for seven decades. The last of the legendary superstars has died. A superstar from an era when American movies were so powerful, the whole globe feasted on our celluloid dreams. And her face. Elizabeth Taylor died of heart failure today at 79. And every generation of Americans knew her and followed her turbulent life. The girl with the violet eyes, the woman who broke the rules, and the pay barriers for women in film. As the world reacted to Elizabeth's passing, and those who worked with her found ways to turn their memories into tributes, Elizabeth's inner world, her family, her intimate circle at her house of Taylor, her closest friends at her foundation, had been there with her in the moment. We didn't know she was going to die when she did. She, She had so many scares in her life. We'd really lived through that before. And to me, at least, it came as a huge shock because she'd been in hospital before. She'd been in comas before. She'd been sick. So it came as a huge shock. So it's not like we we saw it coming and had those conversations like, you know, do you feel like you've done enough? I think that if you asked her, she would say she's never done enough. You know, maybe there are some people who at the end of their life say, I'm at peace with this. I've, 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 you know, I've done the best I can and I'm ready to go. And that's, that's a wonderful idea. And I think that that does happen, but she was just, she just had so much work still to do. I was in LA when she was very, very ill. And I spoke to Tim and I said, Tim, what should I do? Do you want me to go? Should I go or should I not go? And we both decided together not to go. And I was going to keep this memory of the last time I saw her. So I didn't, I didn't see her. And for the funeral, I didn't go. And my daughter told me, Mom, don't come. And uh, I couldn't. And as I say, Elizabeth won't know that I wasn't there. But she knows that I was with her all the time. It was horrible. When she was hospitalized, she was hospitalized for a while. She called me on several occasions to come talk to her about certain things in the hospital. It broke my heart. I didn't want to cry. But she knew she was going to die. And she knew it. And that was hard. I mean, it's just, life just hasn't been the same. So there was always so much more to learn. I mean, she had almost died so many times. Did it have to be now? (laughs) So... It was rough, but, you know, she was sick. She was really sick. It was so uncomfortable for her. So it was October. We went to the hospital, and the nurse called me. I didn't go down. I stayed in her room when she went down to have the um, whatever kind of test they had to do, X-ray or something. And the nurse called me and said, you know, her kneecaps are fractured. And she'd been living with congestive heart failure. And I knew that was the end because she wouldn't be able to move at all. And if you don't move and you have congestive heart failure, the liquid's just going to keep building up. And so it was clear to me at that point that Elizabeth was going to 
die and I cried. It was Christmas Eve and we were just sitting there quietly. Somebody had given her something that sort of did things to the ceiling, a light that put like stars on the ceiling and it moved around twinkling. And it, we were sort of there and just watching it. I think there was music on, like quiet Christmas music. And I started crying. And Elizabeth looked at me and said, what's wrong? And she said, is it your mom? And I said, yes, but it wasn't. It was her because I knew it was going to be the last Christmas I was going to spend with her. And I wish I had just said that. But she knows it now. It's just... That's the thing I regret the most. It's just not being more, you know, not trusting Elizabeth more, not being open more with how I felt. I tried so hard just to do what I was supposed to do and figure it all out on my own. And so I would think that's my only, my only regret. But I know that Elizabeth was so smart that she, you know, she understood and she wouldn't let me go off course. She let me go off to the side quite a bit, but she would pull me back before I failed miserably. And, you know, she made me a trustee long before she died. And it was a shock to me. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what a trustee was. And it's not something I had ever thought about, anticipated. I knew I wanted to be around after she died to protect her. And that's exactly where she left me. With Elizabeth passing, I mean, going through six weeks of both ICU and regular hospital, but mostly ICU and that whole game. One day, it's everything's wrong. Then they fix three things. And then the next day, fix one more and you start to have hope. And then, then two more come up and then three. And it was hard, you know, and Barbara Walters is calling me and, and people want to know what's going on. And I have to put on a protective, I had to protect her. People were wondering, but they always did. But it was harder. This was serious. This was her dying. And I guess I knew that then. And there wasn't another time where it was even a question. She had survived death so much. No one really believed it. But it was a slow, gradual thing. And by the time it was her time, her body had given up, fully given up. And it's quality of life at some point. When we were in the room with the doctors telling us that was me and, um, and the kids, Barbara was there too. And they're basically saying that it's time. So she passed, but I sat with her after she died. And, uh, you know, things went quickly. There was a lot to do. I cried as much as I needed to. I mean, I was hysterical. I mean, of course, I need to say that. Like, I was hysterical. But I felt like I was okay because I was letting the emotion out. I was still doing what needed to be done. We had a lovely service. It was like 40 people. And we didn't do a public memorial till about eight months later. But um, it was awful. I st still to this day. She was larger than life. She, she really was. She was funny. She was bawdy. And then silence. So yeah, it was, it was rough to lose her. It was interesting because I was supposed to be the lawyer. And yet I felt my grief was so minimal compared to her family or to her staff who were with her every day. So I didn't cry. I went to her funeral. I wouldn't cry. I just wouldn't cry. The time I cried <laughs> was when we had to sign a document for each piece of jewelry that we were turning over to Christie's. And when the Krupp ring came by and I had to sign it, that was her. I cried. Elizabeth Taylor passed away on March 23rd, 2011, at the age of 79, surrounded by love. Her death would dominate the press, just as her life had. 
and it would bring on an extraordinary event of historic proportions, one that Elizabeth had prepared herself in a fashion so brilliant it took years of reflection for us to truly see it. A piece of her legacy was going up for auction. Elizabeth Taylor had orchestrated one last shimmering performance that would rock the world. I'm Katy Perry, and this is Elizabeth I. Okay, while most of us will probably never get a 69 karat diamond like Elizabeth Taylor, we can all make our lives a little more luxurious with Rakuten. Rakuten gives you cash back on almost everything from everyday purchases to gifts for the holidays. So it makes it really easy to treat yourself to a little something something too. Get cash back at thousands of stores including Macy's, Target, Barnes & Noble, and Zulily. The hottest sales of the year are happening right now, and with Rakuten, you'll get the most savings plus cash back on top. It's like getting paid to shop, so why not add a little holiday magic and luxury to your life? Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. This is Chapter 9, Legacy. I remember very distinctly that March and where I was when I, you know, when I heard the news, I was in London at our office on King Street. And I was there for an exhibition. And I remember looking at my Blackberry at the time. And there was like a CNN breaking news that Elizabeth Taylor had passed away. For me, everything stopped. It just stopped. And I remember a colleague whom I'm very close to, she looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I said, this is some really very sad news. I feel like our lives are about to change. In the years before her death, Elizabeth had worked with Christie's Auction House to catalog and orchestrate the sale of her collection once she passed. My name is Daphne Lingen. I'm head of the jewelry department in the Americas for Christie's. I've been with the company for 27 years. It is my first job. And I will say that the sale of the collection of Elizabeth Taylor was the highlight of my career. And I don't think there will be anything else that even comes close. Christie's as a whole has been around since 1766. We have sold jewelry since that time. So there's a very long, well-established history of jewelry auctions at Christie's. But this particular sale, the sale of Elizabeth Taylor, it was like nothing I had ever experienced or that most of my colleagues had ever experienced. There's a really beautiful introduction in my love affair with jewelry. The introduction is by Francois Curiel, who has been at Christie's for over 50 years. He was the international chairman of the jewelry department. And in it, he describes in 1998, where he and a group of colleagues went to Elizabeth Taylor's home in Beverly Hills. And that was the first time that we had ever experienced the jewelry in person. It was the time when we actually met her in person. And I was part of that group, group of specialists who went to examine the jewelry. The jewelry is in her home. You know, you consider that most collections, most people who who have collections of significant value, it's kept in a bank vault in a secured location. And these jewels were in her home. These are objects that she loved, that she wore, that she enjoyed. You know, she never meant for them to be kept locked away and and not to be experienced and not to be enjoyed. I think that that's a thread that runs through this collection and, and did for many, many years. And it was so fascinating that The jewelry would come down from the second floor to us. We were seated around a a large round table. It would be in boxes. And the boxes had her handwritten notes on the top of them stating what they were. And And I think about that. And I think about all of the collections that I've seen over my career where people do write little hand note. They write notes like, okay, you know, it's a 
grandma's diamond earrings or mom's pearl necklace. But this was Elizabeth Taylor's handwriting and it was on her jewelry boxes. And it just made it so personal and so intimate. Talking about it now still gives me goosebumps. We were there for two days, seeing the jewelry, looking at everything. I mean, these are things we'd only heard about, we'd only read about. And so to see them in person from, from a jewelry historian perspective, from a gemologist perspective, to see this collection, it was just extraordinary. It's hard to put into words what it meant to see that collection. And she, at one point, came downstairs and introduced herself to each one of us. I remember that. I remember stand, her standing in front of me and saying, hi, I'm Elizabeth Taylor. And it was like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, you're sort of in the presence of greatness, a real force of nature. That was our first introduction to the jewelry collection. And we had had a long relationship from that time forward with her, with the collection. And it was an extraordinary experience. We had regular contact with Barbara, with Tim, with the collection. So, you know, we knew that at some point it would be auctioned. She had made that clear that once she was gone, that the collection would be auctioned. We knew that that was potentially coming. How long had Elizabeth been planning the sale of her beloved collection? Well, if we go back in time, we get a glimpse of Elizabeth's vision. So... Elizabeth did a jewelry book called My Love Affair with Jewelry. And looking through it, Elizabeth basically says over and over again, this jewelry doesn't belong to me. I'm their temporary custodian because I'm going to pass away one day and they're going to go on. Other people are going to own these. And I just hope that people own them with the same joy and love and fun, the sense of fun that, you know, I have. I was sitting at my desk, not actually I was sitting at her desk in the office. She had a an official desk. Uh, and she gave me a quote. I read her the acknowledgments page and she said, I want to add something. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, you can't cry on a diamond shoulder and diamonds won't keep you warm at night, but they're sure fun when the sun shines. And I don't think there's any way to capture her feeling about jewelry better than that. She loved it. And her life was full of health problems and tragedies. However, the jewelry was something that uplifted her. And really her survival came from her always finding things to look forward to and making life better for herself and for other people. That book was a really important marketing tool. And I don't know what was going on in Elizabeth's head. I didn't realize what she was doing at the time, but Christie's used that messaging like crazy. It was in the contract that they do a museum-like exhibit, but they use Elizabeth's quotes all over the place. I'm the temporary custodian. I hope that these go out and are loved and cherished as I have. You know, they used Elizabeth's words to make that jewelry sale not seem sad because it happened nine months after she died. Elizabeth knew what she was doing. I didn't realize it till then. I didn't. I really didn't. But it all came to life and made sense in that moment. How she wasn't claiming ownership. I was just thinking how incredibly smart she was. And I know it's all true, but there's a slant on it. This is going to go off in the world. I, I acknowledge that and I accept that. I'm not going to live as long as the jewelry will live in the world. I'm not going to live forever. Nobody does. But I know that this, there are pieces, particular pieces, and the jewelry in general is going to go off and live in the world without me. And I, I don't necessarily want it to be in a museum. I would like people to wear it. She understood that when she wore this jewelry, it was not only for her own enjoyment, it was because other people love to see it. And there's nothing, there's not a, any bigger draw to Elizabeth than people want to see that jewelry. Elizabeth knew the value of her collection. She knew, over all those decades, that every time she wore a piece in public, she would be photographed wearing it. And 
its value increased. Wealth wasn't her driving motivation for building the collection. As we've heard throughout this series, Elizabeth truly loved and enjoyed the jewelry. She believed in the power of the stones. She was delighted just to look and wonder at them in the privacy of her own home. And she was one smart cookie. Elizabeth hated borrowing jewelry. And it's also really important to her genius, the, her business mind, because she owned her own jewelry. Elizabeth didn't like to borrow. I mean, she would buy it. Because every year at Cinema Against AIDS AMFAR event, there would be a jewelry sponsor and it was expected that Elizabeth would wear their jewelry. And almost every time she bought the jewelry. There was one time we were in Cannes and she wanted to buy a pearl necklace, I think. And she thought, you know what, I'm going to call my business manager and find out if it's okay, if I have the money. And he hemmed and hawed and said, well, Elizabeth, you spend a lot. And, da, 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 da. and she said, oh, shut up. I'm buying them anyway. I mean, she wasn't really asking his permission. And he was like, she just wanted to give him a moment with her. Give him a moment to say yes and be that guy who could say, yeah, Elizabeth, go for it. You know, you've worked hard your whole life. Of course you can buy the necklace. And he said, oh, I don't think you should. And she hung up the phone and she said, you know what? Fuck him. It'll be good for the sale. So she knew that the pieces she was buying would go for astronomical numbers in her jewelry sale. And she made a deal with Christie's. I mean, from the time I came to work for her, it was either going to be Christie's or Sotheby's. And they both courted us. But at some point, Christie's did a better job. She signed a deal with Christie's five years before she passed. Things just mobilized very quickly after that. I mean, the fact that she passed away in March of that year and we had a sale in December, to me, is extraordinary. It, it, it's just it's almost unfathomable that we could put catalogs together, we could put exhibitions together, an international and domestic tour exhibitions. It felt almost unsurmountable, but we did it. And it was uh, an amazing feat. The amount of work and effort and time that we put into this, it seemed like the entire company was just focused on this. You know, for months putting together the catalog, all those catalogs, you know, comes in a box set. And it's not just the jewelry, it's also the couture, it's the handbags, it's all the memorabilia, and making sure that each one of those is cataloged correctly. In addition to all of that, we offered about 2,000 pieces of jewelry in an online sale. We've never done an online sale before. Today, it's normal to have an online sale. We have them every single month. Back then, there was no online platform. We decided to do that because to have all of those things offered in a live auction, it would be an auction that went on for weeks. So we thought, okay, this is really going to be the best way to present this you know, to the global base of collectors. Of course, it was Elizabeth's collection that warranted the first online auction presentation. Our icon was already breaking more ground from the afterlife. And after having learned with her fragrance lines, the power of taking the commodity of Elizabeth Taylor on tour, arranging for a global tour of the collection, was a must. When we decided on the tour schedule, each specialist or specialist in the jewelry department were assigned to different cities. And the two cities that I was assigned to were Moscow and Dubai. And Moscow is an interesting place to take an exhibition. We had an office there. And we decided that that would be the very first tour stop. And the way that customs works, or at the time it did, at least in, in Russia, was that we had to be there for about a month prior to the exhibition. The exhibition was only two days long because everything had to be thoroughly examined by the authorities there that was coming into Moscow, into Russia for this exhibition. So we took a selection of jewelry, we took a selection of couture, and it was going to be on exhibition at GUM, this beautiful, beautiful 19th century building in the center of Red Square, overlooking the Kremlin. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary space. 
So we were in Moscow, again, almost a month prior to the exhibition. We set up the exhibition and we had no idea really what to expect, right? This is the very first tour stop. Before we opened, we had a press preview. And I distinctly remember there was a group of us from Christie's there to represent the company, to represent the collection. And I believe there were over 300 journalists that had flown in from all over the region to be there for this press preview. And I remember at one point, I had one journalist who had taken a hold of one wrist of mine and another journalist who had another arm and a colleague running over to me saying, no, 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 please don't touch her. She will get to you. I just said to myself, oh my goodness, if this is any indication of how the rest of this is going to be, we have vastly underestimated the response to the exhibition. So we opened the exhibition and people lined up for hours, hundreds of people. I have my own personal photos of that and going outside the exhibition space. And if you look at images of GUM, it's spelled G-U-M, you will see it's very, they're very long kind of rows of hallways. And I remember just people lining up and I couldn't believe it. At one point during the second day, we decided that we have to close at a certain time. So security then was dispatched to go to one point in the line and say, I'm so sorry, but from everyone here on, you know, you won't have the opportunity to see the collection because we have to close. It had to be packed up and then on its way to the next exhibition stop. Those hundreds of people remained in line. They kept in the line. And when the doors closed, I don't think I'll ever forget this, the banging, the pounding on the doors, they were demanding to get in. And it wasn't You know, I realize now it wasn't just to see pretty jewelry. I mean, they could see pretty jewelry all over Russia, all over Moscow. They wanted to see Elizabeth Taylor's jewelry. They wanted to see Elizabeth Taylor's couture. It was about Elizabeth Taylor. While we can't all have the lavish lifestyle of a world famous celebrity, we can treat ourselves to something nice during the holidays. Rakuten is here to help with that. Whether you're buying gifts for others or for yourself, you can get cash back at thousands of stores. We're here to help you save money, find the best deals, and get more bang for every buck. Head to Rakuten and get cash back at stores you love, like Macy's, Aveda, Lancome, Michael Kors, Ray-Ban, and more. With the cash back you earn, you can make your holiday season as lavish as Cleopatra. (laughs) Well, almost. Wow your party guests with a perfectly decorated home. Put together a killer party outfit and makeup look. It's all possible with Rakuten. It's like getting paid to shop. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. We just stood there listening to the sound. And of course, security then had to go outside and kind of, you know, say, okay, you're going to have to leave now. I think it just showed the power of Elizabeth Taylor. And I thought, if this is Russia, I can't imagine what the next few tour stops are going to hold for us, let alone New York. So we had 11 days of viewing What we did with the viewing was very interesting. So we knew that we had people who would be coming in just to experience it, just to see the jewelry and the way the caftans were set up was, uh, I mean, it was just stunning. I mean, they were set up on rows, the colors. It was like this magical tour through through our building and the entire building, which is in the center of, of New York City. It's in Rockefeller Center. It, it, it was all dedicated to just her collection. So each room was kind of a different room. You know, you have the boxes, you have the handbag room, you have all of the luggage with her personalized tags that just say mine on them. <laughs> M-I-N-E, right? You have her caftans. I mean, it was just this beautiful sort of tour through her life. 
we sold tickets. We, we, like I said, we knew that people would come in just to experience that, just to be part of that. But we also knew we had people who were serious buyers, serious collectors interested in purchasing part of it. So what we did is a couple of the time before the exhibition opened to the public, we could see clients in person, we could show them things. And then once the exhibition closed, we could do the same. But when, when the exhibition was actually on view and open to the public, nothing came out of the cases, period. We wanted those people to say, I flew from Arkansas, I flew from Texas, and I got to see that. Instead of saying, I went there, I had my ticket, I bought it weeks in advance, and the Elizabeth Taylor Diamond wasn't in the case because it was out being shown. So we knew that that was an important element to the exhibition. I remember the first day, the the front entrance of Christie's is 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 literally like next door the, to the Today Show. So to give people a frame of reference, so if you you know you see the plaza, they're out there on the Today Show. So we're just down the street, and our boardrooms, which have these beautiful windows, a bull nose window, sort of a curved one, looks directly over the entrance to Christie's. And I remember for the first few days of the viewing, I would just go up to the boardroom just to look and see what was going on. Because these were, we had timed tickets. It was all very orderly, but we had over 30,000 people come through our viewing during those 11 days. And sometimes the wait was for hours. Some people couldn't buy a ticket in advance. Some people waited. I and I just remember standing up there and again just thinking, wow, like what have what have we done? I mean, would she would she be happy with this? I hope she would be happy with this. We would all go down into the viewing to hear, you know, so the reactions of people, you know, just experiencing it, people saying, I, I can't believe this is all real. This is so extraordinary. Just people who are blown away by the experience to get so close to Elizabeth Taylor. She was so beloved because she was a person who went through her trials and tribulations, and it was very public. A lot of people thought she was, she really rooted for the underdog, right? She was out, she was passionate, the causes that she was, that were so important to her. And I think that there was that connection to people. And I think that, that that's what kind of drew people to this exhibition and to this sale. Blocks long lines of people came in to see it and they were all getting bottlenecked in the jewelry section. So eventually they had to spread some of the cases through uh, to different areas because uh, they, people weren't moving through. They were all there to see the jewelry. It's something that they did that was hard for me uh, emotionally, but Elizabeth's jewelry boxes, they made a whole room and I knew the boxes. I didn't need to read a label. Most of the jewelry's in drawers, but the important pieces, the really, really important pieces were all in the, in her, in the safe in her jewelry closet, which was out in, through her dressing room. And those pieces for the most part, I mean, I tried to get those back into the safe as quickly as possible. Sometimes they had to sit out because she wanted to look at them, but I tried. I had 10 seconds to get something out of the safe when she asked for it, and I knew those boxes, what pieces were in them, and they did this huge display of all of her boxes on shelves around this room. That was really cool. It was very emotional. I mean, obviously I cried. But Chrissy's recognized that that personal part of it needed to be there. So having Elizabeth's labeled jewelry boxes to have a whole room, that also made it all very personal to Elizabeth. There were these huge images of Elizabeth enjoying her life, enjoying her jewelry. It's just beautiful all over the place. And we had a, a, a private night to invite people and a friend of mine was there. And she looked at these images and said, it feels like you just want her to have more because she's so enjoying it. And I think that that's really important. When Elizabeth would get new jewelry, she would show it to everyone. 
but you never felt like, oh, well, she's bragging or, oh, I, I wish I had that. There was no, because you really, the way that she owned it and, sh and shared it with so much joy in real life, it made you excited too. I mean, it made the other people excited too, and you were excited for her to have this new thing. Like all things Elizabeth, the exhibition set the media abuzz. The power and value of the collection was something that anyone who heard of Elizabeth Taylor and her diamonds could understand. Still, the scope of history encapsulated in Elizabeth's collection was hard for even her most loyal fans to fathom. And some of the jewelry owned by Elizabeth Taylor is about to hit the auction block. More than 260 jewels are for sale, including the famous 33 carat white diamond ring from husband Richard Burton. Also on the block, an emerald and diamond necklace from Burton worn while the couple filmed Cleopatra. The auction begins in December. It's expected to bring in at least $30 million. The fact that the Elizabeth Taylor family has given us this collection to take to the market is an enormous honor and we take it with a great amount of pride and, of course, great seriousness. And at the same time, we're very joyous about it because it's one of the great collections in the world. On December 13th, 2011, at 7 p.m., the jewelry auction began. Expectations were high, but no one could anticipate the historical proportion and intensity of what they were all about to experience. Every serious collector was represented, and all the jewelry houses, the Maisons, who had a chance to buy back some of their own legacies. Lucia Boscaini from House of Bulgari takes us inside that world. I had been preparing for a few months the strategy and negotiating internally the budget, which was quite remarkable. And then me, together with other um, two colleagues and uh, other people helping us from Rome, uh, we attended the, the auctions and we have been able to finally buy back some of the most amazing Bulgari jewels that uh, Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor used to have. So it, it's really something very, very vivid in my, in my memory, I have to say. Of course, uh, in the months and weeks uh, ahead, uh, uh, I felt a lot under pressure. Of course, uh, we were um, talking about several millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, th there was an internal negotiation to, to try to understand realistically which was the budget uh, needed uh, to reach the, the goals we had. Of course, we were very clear in uh, accepting the idea of not uh, being able to fulfill all our goals because uh, the jewels were so many and uh, it was uh, an easy forecast uh, to, to know that, uh, that the prices would have been much higher than the initial estimate from the auction house. So we had this very clear and I have been working also with my team to create a uh, a little Excel file uh, able to readapt uh, all the priorities and then reassign the budget, uh, adding a cap for each lot. Otherwise, considering also the order of the auction, the lots, of course, they were the most important one that were at the end of the auction uh, session. So it, it was uh, quite complicated to come to the definition of the criteria to, to follow. But that was a very rational phase, stressful, but uh, let me say sort of a, a business moment. We flew to, to New York and we um, start, We had a preview in the auction house in, in uh, New York. So I started understanding that it was not going to be a business meeting. It was going to be something much uh, more exciting and more emotional than rational. And so I started um, capturing some vibe, some... <laughs> you know, excitement, I, I started being really thrilled. Then the the actual auction uh, started. It was a December 13. I perfectly remember the date because, uh, as I said, it's really a memorable moment for me personally. And uh, it was uh, unbelievable. It was uh, like a gala. It was uh, 
full of people, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, fans, uh, and there was really a lot of uh, uh, expectations. The provenance of those jewels from one of the most important personalities worldwide of the uh, 20th century. So, of course, uh, the provenance was very important. But this is, uh, let me somehow say that it's uh, maybe the less important uh, reason why we did it. Because it's, um, it is really uh, a set of uh, amazing jewels with or without uh, the provenance, uh, which is still is so important. All the jewels are really iconic. Uh, they are very important um, uh, steps to describe the evolution of the Bulgari jewelry, style, creativity, craftsmanship, uh, expertise and mastery in gemstone. So it's really a, a set of masterpieces that uh, are very helpful for a brand like, uh, like Bulgari to describe and to help people understanding our roots, uh, our uh, real identity as a jewelry brand. And uh, this is also somehow linked to, uh, again, to Elizabeth Taylor personality. She was an amazing actress, uh, a beautiful woman. She was uh, very, very well trained, so to say, about jewelry. I mean, she uh, always uh, used to talk about her passion, her, her love for gemstones and, and jewelry. And she was a, a passionate, passionate uh, collector for sure. She had um, hundreds of jewels from uh, every brand, the, the top ones and the completely unknown ones, because she was really a jewelry lover, but she knew about jewelry. It's always interesting when we offer a collection that has a provenance that has, you know, like a like an Elizabeth Taylor. And and when we approach it, we look at we look at the the jewelry itself. We determine an estimate. What is the jewel worth? What the Elizabeth Taylor factor meant, we could not put a price on that. That's up to a buyer to do that. And that's up to them to determine how much am I willing to go to, to, to buy this piece. We can put a numerical value on it for what it is, but what, it, what her factor meant, we had no way of knowing that. Me and my colleagues, uh, we were in a private office. So we had the perfect situation to stay concentrated, to, to really focus on, on the lots. But still, uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of energy in the air. We chose the top 80 lots of the jewelry to be sold that evening. And it started at 7 p.m. Within Christie's, there are two main sale rooms. One is the James Christie room. That's the largest. And then there's a smaller um, sort of secondary room. That's the Woods room. And the James Christie room was sold out. The tickets, I mean, it was, it was filled with, with people, people who were watching, people who were bidding. And then we had to have this secondary sale room for, the, for additional clients. So we had an auctioneer in that room and we would take bids between the two rooms. And they hold hundreds of people, by the way. So seven o'clock, 80 lots are being offered. And, and just to give you a sense of what a, a sort of normal auction, how we would sell how many lots per hour, we sell 40, 50 lots an hour, 80, 60 lots an hour. So if this was a sort of a not Elizabeth Taylor jewelry sale that we were selling, maybe we would have sold an hour and a half, two hours. So we were there for almost five hours. I remember it was almost midnight before the sale ended. And I was. I was actually phone bidding. So during auctions, we have colleagues who are phone bidding with various clients that have been assigned in advance. I was actually one of a handful of people who was up on stage next to the auctioneer. And I just remember looking out at the audience. I, I get goosebumps right now talking about it. I, I just, I could not believe was I really here? I mean, I was was like pinching myself. Like, how did I get here? Um, how this is truly it's like magical. 
The best of Elizabeth Taylor's famous jewelry was sold off last night, setting a world record for a single collection. And more items from Taylor's estate go on sale today. Elizabeth Taylor played a queen on the silver screen and lived like one in her private life. Last night we told you her famous jewelry collection was going up for auction, but we had no idea how much the buyers would pay. The experts at Christie's Auction House in New York expected the 270 pieces to sell for a total of about $30 million. But the first 80 items on the block brought in nearly four times that, $115.9 million, a record for a single private collection of jewelry. During the sale, it just seemed like the prices, like one astounding price realized after another. In particular, one memory of mine is I was um, I had been working with a client who wanted to bid on the Peregrina. And this was a relatively new client. I remember being on the phone and the client bid and bid and bid. I was the direct underbidder or my client was the direct underbidder, meaning we were just one bid below what it sold for. And, and that piece during that evening, that was the highest selling piece of, this, of that evening sale. So it was over $11 million. It was just one of those experiences where I, I felt like I was part of history and, and making history for a pearl from the 1500s that had been passed through all of those Spanish kings and all of the history that it had you know, in the story of, of Richard Burton purchasing it, ending up in one of the mouths of one of their dogs, the sort of legacy of this pearl and that it was now going on to someone else and that I got to be part of it. And we had achieved this price for it, I think is, is one memory I will just have for the rest of my life. The pre-sale estimate for the jewelry was $20 million. That was the, the low pre-sale estimate. For it to make 145 million was something I think that we never, never anticipated. It was extremely exhausting in the end. So when it was finished and we achieved uh, what we almost all we, we wanted, it was really a moment of celebration. It was a, a beautiful night after that. Today, it still stands as the highest. Uh, or the, the most important single owner jewelry sale ever to come to auction. Do I ever think we will experience something like that again? I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think we all knew, both from a Christie's perspective, but I also think the clients knew that we were all, we were all part of a, an, an amazing experience. This is historical, you know, the sale of this collection whether you were there at the Los Angeles exhibition or whether you uh, in ordered the catalogs or whether you came to New York or you, you actually had the privilege of being in one of the two sale rooms that we had that night or the day after. There were many world records set that day. But the biggest star of the show was a 400-year-old pearl necklace once owned by the Spanish royal family. Burton bought it for Taylor in 1969 for $37,000. It sold last night for a record $11.8 million. Elizabeth got what she wanted, what she always predicted and put out into the world when it came to her jewelry. The precious stones and pearls and beautiful settings that meant so much to her, that brought her so much joy, were now with new custodians. They would live on to be worn, loved, and enjoyed. On the next episode of Elizabeth the First. I kept saying to myself, I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. I am brave. I am brave. I am brave. I am strong. I am strong. I'm very, a very determined person. <laughs>
Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. Joshua Klebe wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese TV. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit elizabethtaylor-aidsfoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon by number one New York Times bestselling author Kate Anderson Brower will be out on December 6. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.